For the first scripture reading this morning, I'll read uh, from Psalms 42, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist expressing longing for God. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food, day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? The second scripture reading this morning is from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 12, a chronicle of Elijah's dramatic encounter with Yahweh at Mount Oreb. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. 
Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Oreb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer Silence. Shh. Be very, very quiet. As Elmer Fudd would say, sit for a moment and just listen. You may close your eyes if you wish. What do you hear? This morning, even in the solitude of this place, we hear the rain, of course. We can hear restless fidgeting, coughing, sniffling, clearing of throats, the air conditioner fans, the hum of the organ blowers. You may have heard a number of things, but one thing you probably did not hear is sheer silence. In our constantly connected, tech-dependent world, there is no absolute silence. But at least we didn't hear a cell phone ring. I was reminded of the difficulty of observing silence last summer when Mark and I visited Connie and Charlie S. in Norway. They met us at the airport outside Oslo, and on the train ride back to the city, we accidentally got in a designated quiet car where conversation is forbidden. Here we were not having seen them in a very long time and wanting to catch up, and we couldn't talk. Silence makes us uncomfortable. We feel like we have to fill it with conversation or music or something. Maybe that's why we have trouble sitting still through 30 seconds of silent prayer. In our digitally driven culture, where we are constantly connected with seemingly endless forums for expressing opinions and sharing every detail of our lives, it is difficult to create time and space for silence. In today's lectionary reading from 1 Kings, Life has become hectic for the prophet Elijah. Now to fill in the backstory, 
Ahab had become king of Israel and married Jezebel, who was a worshiper of the Canaanite storm and fertility god, Baal. We call him Baal. God was not pleased and sent Elijah to Ahab to announce a great drought in the land. In the third year of the drought and resulting famine, God sent Elijah back to King Ahab to announce the end of the drought. Things got a bit ugly. Ahab called Elijah a troublemaker, and in turn, Elijah accused Ahab of apostasy, of turning his back on God. This led to Elijah challenging the prophets of Baal to a contest to determine whose God was the true God. All of Israel turned out to watch this famous showdown on Mount Carmel in which Elijah was the lone prophet of God, pitted against 450 of the prophets of Baal. The people decided that two altars would be erected, one for Baal and one for Yahweh. And whichever God provided fire for their altar would be the winner. First, the prophets of Baal tried to call down fire, and their efforts were in vain. And then Elijah prayed, and the fire of the Lord came down and consumed the sacrificial animal and everything else on the altar. Soon afterward, the rain came to end the drought. Many people confessed Yahweh as their God, and Elijah, the hero, had the prophets of Baal killed. I'm not making this up. You can read all about it in 1 Kings 16 through 18. So as the story resumes in chapter 19 today, Jezebel heard of this. And she vowed to have the same thing done to Elijah that he had done to the prophets. Now Elijah knew that Jezebel was a woman of her word and that she fully intended to have him killed by the next day. So he and his servant fled for their lives. They didn't just flee the northern kingdom they went all the way to the other end of the southern kingdom. And Elijah was still afraid that Jezebel would find him. He left his servant along the way and ventured out by himself into the desert. But after wandering for a day or so, Elijah, at the end of his rope, sat down under a shrub and asked God just to take his life. Exhausted and in a state of deep depression, he lay down and went to sleep. Now one preacher wondered, if Elijah really wanted to die, why didn't he just stay in the northern kingdom and let Jezebel kill him? I don't know. But God had other plans. Twice an angel appeared with food and water and sent him off on his 40-day and 40-night journey to Mount Horeb. Once he was on Horeb, Elijah found a cave and went there to hide, still fearful and feeling sorry for himself. When God asked him what he was doing there, Elijah, in his self-pity, began to complain about how he had done so much for God's people and had been forsaken by them, and how he was the only prophet left, and Jezebel was out to kill him. But God had more to say to Elijah and told him to go out on the mountain 
and listen. For all his complaining, Elijah doesn't get much sympathy from God. But he does get to witness a theophany, a visible manifestation of God. And now here comes what I call the earth, wind, and fire part. A strong wind broke the mountain in pieces. Then came an earthquake. And after that, a great fire. But God was not in the wind. And God was not in the earthquake. And God was not in the fire. Finally, there was silence. The NRSV calls it a sound of sheer silence. And that is a good translation of the Hebrew. Now, according to the narrative, Elijah did not come out of the cave earlier as God had directed. What got Elijah's attention was not the mighty forces of nature. It was the silence that caused him to come out of the cave. The divine presence became real, not in the destruction, but in the silence that followed. After today's passage, the story goes on and reveals that God responds to Elijah's internal struggle, to his fears and doubts, and redirects him to the wilderness of Damascus. Now, I totally ripped off Simon and Garfunkel's 1960s hit song, The Sound of Silence, for the title of this sermon. But the song is not about Elijah's encounter. Art Garfunkel, in an interview, reportedly said that the song was about the inability of people to communicate. Paul Simon, on the other hand, said he didn't know what it was about. He wrote parts of it sitting in the dark in his parents' bathroom because the acoustics were better in there. <laughs> the sound of silence may seem like a contradiction in terms. How can there be silence if there is sound? Old Testament scholar Terence Fretheim a name that I remember fondly from my seminary days, explains that after all the activity and noise, for everything suddenly to become silent is an astonishing moment of sound, the sound of no sound in the immediate wake of loud sounds. It can be deafening. In music, we call that a grand pause. Fretheim says it may be interpreted as the word of the Lord. Could it be for us that silence is a necessary prerequisite for hearing God speak? If we listen carefully, we may hear God speak a word of companionship in the silence of loneliness, a word of forgiveness in the silence of sin, a word of hope in the silence of despair. We need those holy moments of silence when God does the talking and we do the listening. This story assures us that during difficult, painful times, God is still there, often revealed in the silence. Elijah is tired, discouraged, even suicidal, and God is with the prophet. Even at his lowest point, Elijah finds himself able to hear God in the stillness. 
we would do well to make time for silence in our relationship with God. As the prophet Habakkuk reminds us, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I still remember a sign that hung above the entrance to the sanctuary of my home church that read, this is the house of God. Enter it with prayer, reverence, and quietness. African-American author, theologian, and civil rights leader Howard Thurman reflected on his need for silence. I abandon all that I think that I am, all that I hope to be, all that I believe I possess. I let go of the past. I withdraw my grasping hand from the future. And in the greatest silence of this moment, I alertly rest my soul. Silence opens the door to a deeper conversation with God. The 13th century Persian poet Rumi wrote, Silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. It is in those moments of silence that if we listen carefully, if we still our voices and quiet our spirits, we will hear God most clearly. Will you pray with me? Holy God, be with us as we continue to seek you. Show us new glimpses of who you call us to be and teach us to listen as you speak to us in the silence. Amen.